Let's kick this thing, shall we? We are uh, looking at Matthew. We're in chapter 25. We're concluding chapter 25, which means we're almost done with the book of Matthew. Yeah, we're, we're just about, we can, we can see a light at the end of the tunnel or from the ceiling. And, and, and we're, we're getting there to the end. We're almost there. Jesus has been talking about the end times, talking about his second coming. He has been uh, dealing with the tension between persevering, stewardship, and urgency. Okay, he's been dealing with that tension. And what he's going to be getting into now is judgment, which we're all just excited about learning about. I don't know about you, I bet half of you probably woke up this morning think, thinking to yourself, man, can I have a sermon on judgment? So much I just want to know about that. You're welcome. Because <laughs> here it is. Uh, let's start off with a word of prayer, and then we'll kick right into this. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to meet here today. And we thank you so much for this place, that we are able to meet here, to be able to worship you freely here, be able to study your word here. Lord, we don't have to worry about legality issues. We don't have to worry about maintenance issues or anything. Well, Lord, we're just so blessed. We're so thankful for what you have given us. And Lord, I ask that as we continue on this morning, you help us not to be distracted. You help our minds to be focused. Help our hearts to be open and receptive. And if there's any hard words, Lord, let those produce soft hearts in us so that we can come closer to you and honor you more with the lives we live. This I pray in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so here in chapter 25, we're looking at verse 31. That's where we're starting. This is called the conclusion of the Olive Discourse. Isn't that a great name? Okay, we haven't really talked about this name too much yet, but scholars call this the Olive Discourse, or as I like to call it, the, the sermon that he gives on top of a mountain while really upset about the temple. Okay, he had cleared out the temple. He's offended by the temple. He's offended more by the corruption within, even though there's pretty walls on the outside. He told that there's going to be judgment that's going to happen upon the temple. It's going to be destroyed. The disciples got all upset saying, Jesus, look at how pretty the temple is. Look at all the architecture. And Jesus says, no, it's going to all be destroyed. So then he went up on a mountain to pray. And that mountain is of such that when you sit on it and you face westward, you're able to look down and see the gates into the Holy of Holies. And so that's where Jesus is, is on top of that mountain. And he is just frustrated, so frustrated that so many people are like, like a, like a tomb. You look pretty on the outside, but the inside it's rotten bones and just grossness. And so he's just frustrated about that. A couple of disciples go up and they talk to Jesus and they say, uh, hey, Jesus, um, you, you said the temple's being destroyed. Well, what's up with that? So Jesus gives signs for what's happening with the temple and his or what's happening with the end times. And so the signs he gives are not the beginning of the end. The earthquakes and famines and wars, etc. The signs Jesus gives are actually the end of the beginning. It is the process of like a pregnancy. The belly's growing, things are stretching, things are uncomfortable, things are messy, but it's not the birth event of the second coming of Christ. That is significantly later. As anyone who's had a pregnant wife knows, you can be pregnant a really long time <laughs> before you give birth. And people say, well, yeah, it's nine months. Well, for some people, it's longer because there's a delay. You know, the doctors gave my wife, here's due date, and we had to induce labor, both pregnancies, because she was always late by a couple of weeks. Okay, so it, it, we just don't know the birth date. All we know is the signs that pregnancy exists. Okay, that, that hey, this is the end of the beginning. And so we don't know when the beginning of the end will happen, when life will completely change, when that birth event comes and everything's different. Okay, so that's, that's what Jesus has been talking about. And the, he started giving them warnings and saying, you need to be alert, but at the same time, persevere. Know that Jesus could come any minute, but at the same time, it could be not even in your generation. It could be a long way off. And so you need to be alert and prepared as if he came now, but have stewardship and planning and growing and, and, and persevering in your walk with Jesus and working for the kingdom as if you got a long ways before it's ever going to happen. So after all of that discussion, that is when Jesus brings us to verse 31, okay, where he begins to talk about the judgment. And he had been talking about talking in parables, lots and lots of parables. Starting in verse 31, there is no parable here. 
Okay, Jesus leaves the parabolic teaching about urgency and, and perseverance and whatnot. He leaves all the parables behind, and he goes back to talking literally. He goes back to what's called narrative prose. That's the genre here from verses 31 to the end of chapter 25. It's called narrative prose. So it is literally Jesus now teaching. There's metaphors used, but it's not a parable. So this gets to be doctrinally grounded now, okay? Parables, as you might remember, is a story that's thrown alongside a single truth. That's what a parable is. It's a story that's really about one truth. You cannot build doctrines on parables, okay? It's about one truth, and that's it. And we don't over-symbolize all the little details and all the little characters. They're there for the story to function properly, okay? So that's what parables are about. Now Jesus is doing straight teaching. No parables here. The metaphors and the imagery used are not about parables, but about just getting a point across. Okay, so this is where we can build up some doctrinal understanding regarding some end times here, regarding the judgment. We actually get some good, solid material here to really sink into. So, uh, Jesus' conclusion has four parts, two topics. Okay, it has four parts, and there's two topics. What I'm going to do is I'm going to read through this, separating them into the four parts as he is, as Matthew structurally records this part of the sermon. And then we're going to talk afterwards about the two topics because there's a lot of debate on these two topics. Go fig. Okay, there's a lot of fighting, name calling, uh, a lot of slander and libel. In fact, there are even some books that are published that will even say that you are a horrible person if you disagree with this point of view. And then other people wrote books saying, well, you're a horrible person if you agree with that point of view. And back and forth it goes. And in fact, even got to the point where one pastor actually wrote in a recent book that if you follow along the way that you're supposed to follow this, you he said, if you believe this stuff to be true that Jesus is teaching, then you cannot call yourself a Christian. You can't. You can't be a Christian and believe this stuff. This is horrible. This is anti-God. And we and, and he it goes way off the, the, the beaten path like crazy. And then another pastor, along with him, wrote a side book that said that anybody that believes literally what Jesus teaches here, they're, they're little Jesus Hitlers. And that they're just being these horrible, evil, personified of evil people. And they're just, I mean, we're talking brutal name calling. Okay, brutal. The, the fight on these two topics are the reason, I believe, that the church has lost its impact in our society. That people are ignoring the church today more than they ever did in the 90s or the 80s because of the fight on these two topics. And because of the church's inability to properly understand these two topics and to properly convey and teach these two topics. Okay, so I believe these two topics that we're going to be talking about from these four section conclusion, these two topics are really the downfall of the church or the potential for the rebirth of a new church. Okay, that we can revitalize and revive if we can just grasp these two issues. Okay, they're that core, that essential, all right? And you might be wanting to think, well, well, I mean, one of the topics has to be who Jesus is. And surprisingly, within the church, that's not the big debate. That was the big debate in the 90s. That was the big debate with the turn of the century. That's also 13 years ago. Lots have changed. And the church is fighting about something very, very different. And it's not about who Jesus is so much as it is about who is God the Father and what does Jesus teach? And there's two topics here that are huge, okay? So we're going to have to go through these with great care, great caution, great grace, great patience. And we're going to have to learn how to use hard words to produce soft hearts. It's going to be rough, okay? So you ready for the journey? What, we're just all going to go home? <laughs> it was like, I don't know now. <laughs> I'm scared. <laughs> so, so we're, we're going to have to work through this together, okay? You, you can do it. I know you can. So are you ready? Yeah. Okay, good, good. Five of us are on board. So exciting. <laughs> okay, so starting at verse 31, where Jesus starts with here is the setting of the judgment. So 31, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them 
from another, one from another, just as shepherds separate the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. See, this is not a parable. This is just a metaphor. Jesus is saying that God's going to separate the righteous from the wicked like a shepherd separates sheep from goats because you don't want that to get all mixed up, okay? And so that's just what, just what God's going to do. So from verses 34 to 40, what ends up talking about here is the desire and the call for the righteous to enter the kingdom of God. Okay, so starting at verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I love that phrase, by the way, from the foundation, from the beginning of time, before humanity was made, God was working on his kingdom and was calling people to his kingdom. Okay, so when you look at Genesis and you see the six days of creation and before Adam was made, before Eve was made after him, you got God making the heavens and the earth and preparing his kingdom. Because this kingdom is ultimately the what? The new earth. Okay, and God is not going to obliterate this earth and start from scratch. He is going to purify this earth in a more complete fashion, like what the floods of Noah purified this earth. Okay, so the floods of Noah came in, did not obliterate this planet. The floods of Noah came in and purified this planet, but not perfectly. Later, God's going to use fire and is going to judge this world perfectly and purify it perfectly. That'll be later. That's the new earth, but it's still this planet. Okay, things can survive the fire just like things survive the water. Okay, so God is preparing from the beginning his kingdom. Then he, Jesus goes on and he says, the people that are entering in, the people that are righteous, he explains why they're coming in. Verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick, you took care of me. I was in prison, you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And then what Jesus goes on next is from verse 41 through 45 is the banishment from the of the wicked into eternal fire. Okay, so first it was, here's the setting of the judgment. There's going to be a separation. And then it's welcome the righteous into the kingdom and goodbye to the wicked. You're not entering the kingdom. You're going someplace a lot worse. And so the king, uh, it's here verse 41, then he will also say to those on the left, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. I was naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or without clothes, or sick, or in prison, and not help you? Then he will answer them, I assure you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you, will, you did not do for me either. And then Jesus gives a real quick chiastic type conclusion. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Okay, so this is the whole topic, the rest of chapter 25. Isn't that fun stuff? Now the two topics. This is what you guys came here for, right? <laughs> just came here for just this great debate regarding topic number one, the issue of eternal punishment. The issue of the doctrine of hell. You tell this is going to be uplifting. <laughs> the topic of eternal punishment. Now, here's what's going on. There is what's called the postmodern views. Okay, some of these are not new. Some of these are new. The postmodern views are what the emergent church is really bringing up and about and are trying to declare and teach. 
and the emergent church is teaching these postmodern views that have some real interesting problems with them. So I'm going to share with you the most common of the postmodern views. Number one is that hell is not eternal. And that's one of the most common views to run across is that hell is not eternal. And what is taught is that God will either empty hell, okay, he will either empty hell, and what this means would be that you go to hell temporarily, and then God will one day usher everybody out of hell and into the new earth. This is one of the things talked about by Rob Bell's new book, Love Wins. That if you are a person that has nothing to do with Jesus, if you're a person who does not love and have not experienced love and do not love, then you will go to hell until you learn love. And once you learn love, then God will bring you into heaven because love wins. Okay, that's what's taught in that new book by Rob Bell. Actually, it's not too new anymore. He has another book that has come out since then. Uh, but so that's that. Uh, God will empty hell. That's in one part of this view, that hell is not eternal. Another one that isn't as popular now as it used to be. It is lowering in its popularity, but it still exists from time to time. It's called annihilationism. Basically, what that teaches is that God will destroy hell. Okay, That, that God will put people into hell, and then God will delete hell. And all the people in it, so it's not eternal, there's not eternal punishment, it's temporary, and will be deleted. Okay, that is not, like I said, it's not talked about too much anymore. The God emptying hell has dominated the discussions and the publications. Okay, that is the real forefront of that view of hell not being eternal. A second view or teaching of postmodernism regarding the issue of hell, the first one was hell is not eternal, the second one is that Hell does not exist. That hell does not exist. This is also very popular in some of the emergent church circles and in modern pub postmodern publications. And here's how they deal with this. They say that, and Rob Bell has taught this as well as other people like Tony Jones and a few others have taught this, and that the teaching is, is interesting. It says that heaven and hell are metaphors to motivate people toward morality. Okay, and that this earth will be your heaven or your hell. And this life will be your heaven or your hell. And how you respond to life and how you deal with life and how you, what choices you make will make this world, this life, a heaven for you or someone else or a hell for you or someone else. And, and we, can under, we can say, yeah, we, we make our lives difficult or not difficult based on a lot of our choices. You know, but that's... There's a real problem with this view. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's the argument. That's the view, okay? And so um, when people try to deal with this, even in conservative circles, here's what they tend to sometimes do. This is the direction even in conservative circles, that Jesus came and conquered hell, and because he conquered hell, nobody goes there. So therefore, it, only, it doesn't exist for humanity. If anything, it exists just for demons and Satan, and that's it. And then humans will never see it because Jesus conquered it. Because he died for all sins for all time, whether they accept him or not. That his salvation is not limited to our actions of belief or faith. And therefore, Jesus conquered hell and ever, no one will ever see hell. And that when Jesus went to hell, he brought all the people that were there originally out and basically emptied it. And so now hell technically does not exist. That's kind of the conservative twist that has happened with that. So those are two of the arguments. we got one more. First, hell is not eternal. That's what some people teach. Hell does not exist. That's another teaching that's common. And then the third one is that hell is not for the earthly. Very similar to what we just got through talking about, that humans will never see hell. Hell is a spiritual realm for spiritual beings, not for physical beings. Okay, so that's that. And then they tend to have with this other arguments to help support their points of view. Stuff like it's unfair for God, who is a loving God, to permanently punish people for temporary sins because when they sin it's just an action that has its end and its consequence and it's over and it's a temporary sin temporary actions why would god punish eternally for something that's temporary and uh, they tend to say that god is so loving and so gracious that he would never end anyone into such an endless pain and suffering he would never punish anyone in that manner and that tends to be another argument that they give. 
So those are the most common postmodern views regarding this. And then what they say is, like in the Love Wins book and other type of books like the New Christian or the New Christian Church and the New Church, uh, written by Tony Jones and other such publications, is if you believe in hell, the permanence of hell, the eternality of hell, the completion of punishment, if you believe in that, then you are the most unloving, Hitler-like Christian that wants to see people burn for eternity, and that you have no forgiveness, you're totally bitter, and you have you don't belong be associated with the church in any way, shape, or form. In fact, you cannot call yourself Christian, a loving Christian, if you believe in hell or the everlastingness of hell. And that's what's taught very directly in a lot of those books. Isn't that fun? And so uh, we're going to go from the point of view of what Scripture teaches. And I'm going to show you why these views are incorrect. Okay, so I'm going to go through these and try to show you why these views are incorrect. Okay, why these are biblically false positions to hold on to. And what's sad is many people from in my position who look at these postmodern views and go, man, what's up with these views? How, how can you, you know, and they respond with, how can you believe this? You crackpot. And they start writing names back. You ignorant, feeble-minded, you don't know the Bible, your head's up your butt so far, you can see earwax, and, and on and on, <laughs> the, the, the name calling goes. <laughs> There's got to be a way to teach the truth in a loving manner. That we can be respectful and tactful and yet say hard words. Okay, there's got to be a way to do that. And so I'm hoping we can come to that this evening or this afternoon, by this evening. Come to that this morning. I'm hoping we can be able to, to work through that. So first off, I want to go through why these views are incorrect. Okay, number one, hell does exist. Okay, looking at scripture, hell does exist. Okay, Matthew 25, 41 is very, very clear that hell does exist. In fact, the way Jesus is teaching this is that you got eternal life and you got everlasting eternal death. You got, you got great punishment, reward in the kingdom, and you got everlasting fire. And you can't say that Jesus is literal on one and then symbolic on the other. Right? You can't, you can't go that route. Okay, Jesus is being literal here with this, so hell very much absolutely does exist. First Peter chapter 3 talks about Jesus going into hell, into the heart of the earth. He proclaimed to the spirits there in prison, as I had taught this in the past, his sermon to the demons and people in hell was a really simple sermon. Jesus went to hell and, and, and taught this. I win. You know, that, that's what Jesus' sermon was. Okay, it was a sermon of victory over death. Okay, it was the sermon of victory over death. Okay, so, um, and here's the other thing. If hell does not exist, then what do you do with Satan and his demons? Do they roam forever and ever and there is no uh, eternal life with Satan and his demons constantly there, always having temptation, always having falls, always having sin, always having rebellion and evil and wickedness and murders? Is that eternal life of happiness and pleasure of the new kingdom the way God wants it to be? No. So you got to have somewhere for Satan, at least Satan and his demons to go. Okay, that you just got to have that somewhere. Otherwise, they're just roaming about doing things. Okay, so you got it's just you're not even logical to have that type of a view that God would make one and, and then be symbolic about the other. So it's interesting that so many will say, well, yeah, Jesus was talking the truth about eternal life and the new earth. That's all literal. That's all appropriate. When he talks about hell, well, then that's metaphorical. That's weird. And then the people who say that, well, you see, both are metaphors, then they imply then that there is no eternal life. Because both are metaphors. That means that if both are there and this life is either a heaven or a hell, then what happens after you die? Where's the eternal life? What did Jesus die for? What did he rise again for? Okay, you got a whole big mess if you're going to say that there is no eternal life at all. That right there just eliminates a lot of scripture all over the place. Okay, it eliminates everything about the promised land, everything about the theology of rest, everything that Hebrews talks about, everything that Moses worked toward, everything that Paul worked toward, is saying that there's no resurrection. 
To say there's no eternal life is to say there's no resurrection. So you can't have both of them being metaphor. Otherwise, what did Paul say? If there is no resurrection, then life has no meaning, has no purpose. That Jesus died in vain, rose again in vain. All of it's meaningless. Let's go ahead and eat, drink, and be merry. Let's go ahead and get ourselves a Jack Daniel one hand, a prostitute in the other, and go ahead and make a peanut butter jelly sandwich by putting our hands together. You know, and, and, and might as well just live like that because what difference does it make? Okay, so, so the scripture is very, very clear that there is life after death, and it's either going to be good or it's going to be bad. It's either going to be a blessing or a punishment. Okay, so that part is extremely clear. Hell is also eternal. Hell is also eternal. Not only does hell exist, hell is also eternal. Again, Jesus talked about heaven or the kingdom of earth, or the kingdom of God on the new earth is lasting how long? How long does the kingdom of God last? Eternity, right? Jesus had come into eternal life, right? That's, that's, you can go into Hebrews that Jesus died for all sins for all time so that we may have life eternal, life everlasting, right? That, that is something that happens afterward. That's Hebrews chapter 10, by the way. And so that you have something that lasts forever, okay? So if one lasts forever, and so does the other, because Jesus equates them equally here in this passage. You go into eternal life, or you go into eternal death, as is sometimes is said. Okay, that both last for eternity. Even when you look at the, the, the uh, whole hell is eternal here, when you look at what Jesus talks about this eternal fire here, and when he says that you go into eternal punishment right there in verse 46 they will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous go into eternal life this eternal the word literally means a period of unending duration that is the direct interpretation of that word it is a period of unending duration that's from the chicago university greek lexicon definition for you okay so you can't even say that one's tainted by christians <laughs> that's from the university of chicago it, the word literally means a period of unending duration. It is there forever. Okay, it's that way with life and it's that way with punishment. Okay, and then lastly, and then we'll continue on here with what's all going on here with this. Lastly, hell is intended for the earthly. Hell was made originally, as, we're, as Jesus describes it, for whom? Satan and his demons, okay, that it was made for them, that when Satan rebelled against God and the demons rebelled with them and they went off and, and got casted out of heaven, that God made hell for them. And those who reject Jesus, who reject the church, okay, who, who reject God and team themselves up with Satan and his demons, they're playing for his team, will suffer the fate of the team. Football is a great analogy for this. We want to talk about hell. <laughs> Football is a great analogy for this because what team are you playing on? Okay, if you got, let's say, um, what was that was playing yesterday? It was University of Michigan versus Nebraska, right? Uh, another, we were talking about hell here, right? So that's an okay game to talk about. <laughs> so you got University of Michigan versus Nebraska. Right, So within that game, right, when a team wins, another team loses. Right, That's pretty duh. Now, when the team loses, does the whole team lose or just the quarterback? The whole team. Right, It's not like you can say, oh, look, you lost, but hey, you know, you're forward. He wins. <laughs> Why? He's on the wrong team. He's not on the winning team. He's on the losing team. And so that's what how Jesus is, in a sense, structuring. That's how this is structured, how God has structured this. What team are you on? Are you on the team that goes to the kingdom of God, eternal, eternal life? Or are you going to be with the other team? That you reject the winning team. You reject the coach. You reject everything. And you're on the losing team. And then you expect that God's going to say, you know, I feel so bad that you lost. Come over here and have a have a Super Bowl ring anyway. You know, that, just no. That's not how it works. If you associate yourself with the losing team, you lose. That's what happens. Okay? And so that's why both 
It's why eventually people do end up in hell because they've aligned themselves with the losing team and they go where the losers go. Okay, back home, <laughs> as far as football goes. You know, and so they go where the losers go. That, that's kind of how this is structured here. So humans do go to hell. Yes, it was created for Satan and his demons. Jesus said so. And humans go there if they're playing on their team. So that's kind of how that is. So why all this tension? Why are people so mad about this topic? What is at stake? That's how I want to look at this question, is by asking a sub-question, and that is, what is at stake here? Okay, first off, there are a couple of things that are at stake. I want us to be able to wrap our mind around so we can understand. First off is a worldview issue. Okay, this is a worldview issue. Now, worldview is how we view our world. That's a simple definition. But it's more than that. Every human being has a worldview. The question is, is it right or is it wrong? Or is it partially right and wrong in some areas? And that means it is how we interpret life, how we interpret what's wrong with our world, how we interpret what the solution is, and how we interpret if we can contribute or not, if we can participate with it or not. Okay, and a worldview has various levels to it. Some are very surfacey. We can be wrong and we don't care. It's not any skin off our nose. Some are more secure in our lives and they're more to the center and we hold them with great conviction. And if you tell us we're wrong about it, we're going to get very defensive. And then some are at an actual core, like, an, like the core of an onion or an apple. And it's right there. And if you tell me I'm wrong about that, then you're telling me that everything I have based my life on is worth. Okay, for example, if we heard a noise, we're home alone. Let's all pretend we're home alone, okay? We're, we're home right now, and we're all in our apartment, our house, our condo, wherever, okay? We're all in our home. Let's say you're alone, no kids. Some of you are like, hallelujah, you know? <laughs> okay, and so you have no kids, right? If you're married, your spouse is not home. Again, the hallelujah chorus. Um, okay, you, you don't have any roommates if you're at college, you don't have any, uh, uh, you know, parents if you're living with your parents, you don't have anything, it's just you, okay, and you're walking through, and you're enjoying yourself, right, because it's quiet, it's simple, then all of a sudden you hear a noise, hear something, I think I just heard something, you know, and so what do you do? You make a surface level judgment that says, I heard a noise. I think somebody's home. I think somebody's home. That, that, that's a surface level judgment, surface level worldview statement. I think in my environment, I heard a noise. Somebody's home. Okay, so you go and you look. You walk around. You go into the living room. You go into the kitchen. You're walking around. You don't see anybody. You go into the bathroom. You don't see anybody. So you're wrong. Nobody's home. Any skin off your nose? No. But now you got to go to a deeper level. I know I heard something. <laughs> okay. I know I heard something. So now you start going to a deeper level. I, I know I heard it. So what was it? Maybe it was a car driving by. Maybe it was a neighbor. Maybe it was somebody in the hallway outside the apartment. Maybe it was a TV or a radio. Maybe something fell. And you start looking around. You open the door. You look outside. You don't see anybody. You look out the window. No cars anywhere. You look around. No pictures have fallen. The TV's off. The radio's off. Now how are you starting to feel? You might be okay but you're starting to get uncomfortable. But I know I heard, especially if you hear it again. And you're like, I know, I, what is that noise? And you're looking for what is, and you're like, not the lights, they're not buzzing. Am I sure? You start unplugging things, right? Have you done this? You, know, you unplug something, maybe, maybe that's not buzzing, that's not it. And you look and you look out, you look, where's my phone? There's my phone, where's the computer? It's not that. The TV for sure is off. There's no speakers. 
And then you hear it again. You're like, you know, is there somebody on the upper level, lower level? Nope, nobody's home. Nothing's happening. Now you start getting upset because you have a deeper level of understanding that says that I can trust my senses. You have a deeper level that says my brain is functioning properly. And now if you keep hearing the noise and there's no cause for it, what do you start to do? You begin to possibly doubt your brain. You begin to doubt your ears. My ears are playing tricks on me. My mind is playing tricks on me. And if it happens enough, you make an appointment. All right? Because that's disturbing. And have you ever had to make a doctor appointment because you know something's wrong, you just don't know what? And how uncomfortable that is. How scary that is. You know what people do when they have to make an appointment and they don't know what it's for? They call out to people and they say, pray for me. I'm scared. Pray for me. I don't know the results. Pray for the doctors that they have wisdom because I don't like knowing something's wrong and we don't know what. I don't like knowing that there's a problem and I can't fix it and that this could just alter everything. It could alter my way of life. It could alter how I'm satisfied with life. It could alter my contentment. It could alter everything. I could be permanently sick or die. And I, I don't want this to happen. I'm afraid. Why? Because we're getting more toward the core, right? That says that I want to live and I want to enjoy life. And whenever that gets threatened, we respond. Sometimes we respond with anger. Sometimes we respond with violence. Sometimes we respond with aggression and frustration. Sometimes we respond with fear and anxiety. And then the anger is in response to that fear. We want to hang on to something. And when other people start messing with our life, we're like, just leave me alone because I got these, all these problems and it's overwhelming me. And I'm afraid my core is being disrupted. Now, we're all on the page with that, right? When you start telling somebody that there is a hell and it is everlasting and that if you do not accept Jesus, that's where you will go what you are doing is you're tampering with their core from the get-go. You didn't work your way down the layers, getting to the center. You just went straight to the heart. And you, Because most people, if they don't believe in Jesus, they don't believe in Scripture, and they don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture, they're going to believe that, well, really what's wrong with the world is ignorance and all we need is education. And if we just educate people, then that's great. But there isn't really a heaven or a hell. This life is all there is. Or everybody can get to heaven as long as they're loved. As long as they have love, then they'll get there. And that's all, and that's all you need. Okay, and then you start telling them that, no, you can go to hell if you don't have Jesus. It's not just about love. You can be a very loving person and still end up in a very bad place. And you can be a very decent person and kind person, but still end up in hell. And then it's forever because you don't have Jesus. You don't have forgiven sin. You don't have repentance. People right down to the core. And how do you respond when your core gets disrupted? With aggression, fear, anger, defensiveness. Okay, this, this makes evangelism a very almost violent thing when you think about it, because you are disrupting people's core. It's one of the reasons why it was rarely effective to go up to a house, knock on the door, and say, if you died today, would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? Yeah, let's just go up to people and take like a bow and arrow and go straight to the heart with it. Let's not try to get down layer by layer and try to compassionately with some type of tactfulness work them to the core so that they can rebuild the core and relay their layers. Let's just go right to the heart. You know what happens when you shoot a bow and arrow right at the heart of an onion? It explodes. Right? It makes a mess. You might as well put an M40 on one of those things or an M80 in one of those things and say, let me see your core. <laughs> you know, you might as well. Because it's just, it's, it, you're, you're being completely disruptive in their life. And we need to be, we need to share Jesus. We need to share Jesus. But we need to be very careful and how we do it. We need to be very gentle. What is it that the Bible says that you are to share the truth in love? 
that you care about the person and how you do it. The process is just as important as the product. Sharing Jesus is vitally important. How you share is just as important. Just as important. Because we got this worldview issue. So there's a lot at stake here. When we're talking about eternal punishment, we're talking about going straight to the core of a person's belief. If someone came up to you and said, hell doesn't exist and you're evil for even thinking of such a thing, how are you going to feel from that statement? Put them up, put them up, put them up, right? You're going to go lying on people. Maybe not cowardly lying, but you know what I mean. You're, you're going to go on it on people, right? You're going to have that feeling inside. Your, your pulse is going to race and your heart's going to quicken. Your breath is going to get shorter. Your, 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 your hands might even get a little twitch right along the pinky finger, right? And you'd be like, oh, I'm going to get, I'm, right? Because you're going to get nervous and defensive because someone just took a shot at your core and it goes the other way. So that's part of what is at stake. Another thing at stake, why this is such an important issue is it's about the holiness of God. This whole thing is about the holiness of God. Okay, think about it. Sin is a violation of God's holiness. God is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of grace. And because he is a holy God, he is a God of justice. He is a God of wrath. He is a God of judgment. He is judge and king. Okay, he is a holy God. And our sin violates his holiness. But here's what I've noticed, that holiness is a concept lost in the modern church. For over 10 years, I have given tests to Christians. In our church and in other churches, at seminaries, at colleges, in youth groups, youth retreats, youth camps, all across the place, Okay, I have given a very similar type of a test. And the test is really, really easy. I just tell them, describe for me God. In our membership class, we go through this. Everyone who's gone through the membership class with me has gone through this question. Describe for me God. How do you describe God? What attributes does he have? And here's what every, most people usually come to. First, it's silence. People go, I don't know. I'm like, well, do you serve God? Yeah, well, who are you serving? You tell me you don't know God, <laughs> you know, and they're like, well, well, I'm like, describe him. If someone doesn't know who's God and people start shouting out answers. They start writing down stuff. They're like, well, he, he, he knows stuff. <laughs> well, that's good. How much does he know? Well, everything. Oh, good. So he's all knowing. Good. And we write that down. Well, what else about God? Describe him. Once you get that first one, then it's the landslide, right? People start saying a lot of things. Well, oh, this is easy then. If that's what you want, cool. He's, he's all powerful. Oh, good, good, good. He knows all. Yeah, yeah. He's present everywhere. Oh, good, 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 good. He's loving. Oh, very good. Very. He's merciful. God of grace. Yes, absolutely. You know, and on and on they go. And then when we're all done, you know what one they missed? 100% of the time, holy. 100% of the time, holy. Usually, and, and more times than not, I'm gonna, I, I don't have exact statistics on what I've experienced. Close to eight times out of 10, close to 80%, do not say that he's a God of wrath. They do not call him judge. And rarely also they call him king. But never have I run across a group say holy. And holy is what builds his entire character. That's, what, that's who God is. In fact, of all the titles that God has been described as and that people have praised him, and that the angels have praised him with, guess what word is used the most? Holy. We sang a song called the Revelation Song because the angels are surrounding the kingdom of, are surrounding the throne of God and looking at Jesus and they cry out three times, holy, holy, holy. Okay, it's his dominant attribute and it is the one Christians miss the most. And when you remove God's holiness, you remove the seriousness of sin. Well, it's just a natural byproduct. You remove holiness and what it means. Sin becomes no big deal. Sin becomes no big deal. You cannot get the depth of what sin has done if you don't grasp what holiness is if you don't grasp even a glimpse that God is so holy that if we were to see it in his purity, it would consume us. It would destroy us. 
people with just a glimpse. Moses, from just seeing God's butt, fell to the ground and glowed for a long time. I kid you not. Okay, God, he said, I want to see you, God. And God says, you can't see me. If you see me in my entirety, it will destroy you. And Moses is like, I want to see just something. So God put Moses in a cave, put his hand over, the, God put his hand over the cave, walked by the cave, removed his hand, and allowed Moses to just see his backside. Right? And so, and, and Moses was just astonished by this. He was changed by it. It was so amazing. Not because God had a magnificent rear. But because his holiness is that phenomenal that all he could see was the backside because to see it in its entirety and its purity would be too much to handle and Moses would be obliterated from it. I mean, just, we, it's just, just hard to even wrap our minds around that. And then people say, well, well, you know, God wouldn't put someone in hell because it was just a temporary sin. But it violated an eternal holy God. We need to re-understand the holiness issue that's here. So those are the biggest issues that are at stake with topic number one. Now, topic number two. I think we'll be here till the evening after all. <laughs> topic number two. Who are the least of my brothers? Who are the least of these? Okay, because Jesus goes through this very interesting description of feeding, of giving drink, of clothing, of providing visitation in prison, and, and, and providing shelter, and on and on it goes, right? And so, and Jesus says that whoever does this for the least of these brothers of mine are going to be considered righteous. Who doesn't do these are going to be considered wicked, and they're going to see hellfire. Okay, so there's a lot of debate then as to who are the least of these brothers of mine. Okay, some people make the mistake in thinking that it is anyone who is poor, anyone who is homeless, anyone who asks for help, anyone who is uh, thirsty or without clothing, that if you aren't going to help these poor people, then you're, you're wicked. And that's actually a misunderstanding of the text completely. There are passages in Scripture that says, go to the poor and needy and take care of them. Take care of the orphan and the widows. There are a lot of verses for that, but that's not here. That's not what Jesus is talking about in this passage. He's talking about something a little bit different. He is saying, whoever does these for the least of my brothers, which is Jesus' true spiritual family he's referring to a.k.a. the church. Okay, yes, there are lots of verses about helping poor people. This is specifically, what Jesus is specifically looking at here is how you handle the church, the body of Christ, Jesus' true family, his brothers and sisters. Okay, that's what this is completely talking about here. Okay, his family there. And so the, we can look at this difficult topic here, and we can ask a different question, and that is, do you love the church? Do you love the bride of Christ? Because if you reject and hate the bride, you're rejecting and hating the groom. Okay? That, that's how this is working out here. You reject the bride, you're going to reject the groom because the groom says you either accept me and my bride or you don't accept me at all. And I can understand this. If somebody wants to be my friend but refuses to accept Rachel and says I will only be your friend when she's not around, I can't stand her, I don't want to be around her, I want nothing to do with her. In fact, you can't even mention her, you can't talk about her, you can't be about her. When you're with me, it's just you and I. I'm going to be like, yeah, eat rocks. Yeah, we can hang out without my wife. That's fine. I'm going to talk about her. Why? Because she's great to talk about. And I'm excited about being married to the hottest girl in Grand Rapids. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I'm going to talk about her. I'm going to talk about my kids. I'm going to talk about my family. That's what I'm going to talk about. Why? Because I love them and they're part of, who, part of my life and what I'm about. And if you're saying you're going to reject them, then we're not hanging out. 
You're not going to get me then. That's just how it's going to be. Some ladies like this about their cats. <laughs> I see it on date sites sometimes. Not recently. <laughs> but I, I've seen this in the past on date sites, you know, where you go online, they're like, I am a woman with a cat. And if you don't accept my cat, we can't date. <laughs> I'm like, wow. Some guys are that way with their dog. <laughs> you know, and it's just how it is. But, but Jesus is very much that way about his bride. Okay, so doing this for the least of these brothers of mine. So I want to take this literal stuff he's talking about here, this hungry, this thirsty, this giving shelter, clothing, visiting in jail, all of these. I want to, I want to try to lump these into three general categories that I can paint with a broad brush. Okay, to try to look at these, these are not uh, metaphorical. Oracle, these are literal Jesus saying that you need to take care of. I just want to put these in a general context for us to sink our teeth into. Okay, and it looks like three S words for you. Okay, so three S words for you. So number one, do you strengthen the church? This is a person who is hungry, who's, who's cold, who's naked, and what this person is doing to help them is to strengthen them up. So do you strengthen the church? Do you strengthen her? Or do you neglect encouraging the church because, you know, you're tired and you don't feel like worshiping, so you stay home to take a little nap, and therefore you end up not being present. And then the church looks around, not being encouraged by your existence and not being strengthened because you're present because you're all about yourself and just want to go home and sleep or go to the zoo or go play a game or go watch a movie. I've seen a lot of people say that, you know, I, why weren't you in church on Sunday? Well, you know, I was just too busy. And yeah, you posted on Facebook that you went to the store and you went to a movie and you went to the zoo. You know, well, that's just great. You know, thanks for strengthening the church. Do you really love the church or do you just go out of your own conscience and your own sense of self-guilt? Or do you really love the church? And if you really love the church, you show up for her. You strengthen her. You encourage her. It's what you do. And going to the local church is an expression, is how we can do it for the universal church. Because we can't be in every building on every single day of the week throughout the country, throughout the world, but we can express our love for the universal church by displaying our love in the local church. This is why Hebrews is so fanatically, almost fanatically stating that do not forsake the assembling together. Do not get into that habit. You go and you worship, even if you don't want to, even if you don't feel like it, because it's not about you. It is about the body of Christ being strengthened and encouraged. You know what? Especially, this is especially true in a small church. You get a church of under 100 people, and suddenly five or six decide that they don't feel like it, and they stay home. What ends up happening with the rest of the group? They notice a lot of empty chairs. And they begin thinking, well, are we dying? Are we shrinking? And, and granted, all that viewpoint is all on, on us instead of the outreach of the kingdom, but it becomes discouraging. Your absence or your presence builds or destroys, encourages or discourages the, the church, the body of Christ. So do you strengthen her? Do you show up and basically bringing by your presence food and drink and clothing? The second S would be, do you serve the church? Do you serve the church? It's one thing to see a person that has no food and to say, I got food. But are you going to serve by actually giving it? Do you serve the church? Or do you just use the church for your own ease and own comfort and sense of conscience? So do you strengthen the church? Do you serve the church? And then lastly, do you support the church? Do you support the church? And this has to be sacrificially supporting. So when you're looking at this person and he's hungry and somebody feeds him, what is somebody doing? They're supporting that person. They are giving something that they have to this person. 
They are without a place to live. Well, come, let me sacrifice myself to support you. Come here and stay under here. You're in jail. Well, guess what? That I'm going to have to sacrifice myself to support you. So I'm going to take aside my time. I'm going to show up and I'm going to sit down. I'm going to talk with you on the other side of the glass or between the bars or down into the hole in the ground like it might have been during most of the Bible times. You know, that it would be that type of a, you're just showing up and you're supporting do you support the church? Or do you use all your resources and all your time for your own personal, selfish agendas? Do you support the church? It's real easy to make this part about tithing. And some people are like, you know, well, why should I give 10% of my money to the church, you know, when I have my ends are so tight the way it is? And we need to flip that around. Because God would reply with, well, why should I give you 90%? Because it's not about how much of our money do we give to God. It's about how much of God's money do we keep. He provides the income, whether it's through the state, whether it's through resources, whether it's through family, a gift, an offering, whether it's through a job, he provides the money. And it's all God's. And it's not about how much of my money do I give him, but how much of his money do I keep. And that also helps with stewardship throughout the rest of your life with the money that you keep. Because if you give 10% back to him, keeping 90% of God's money, then what are you going to do with God's money? We had that whole investment question last time. When you give your, when you love something, you're going to sacrifice for it. You just are. When you love someone, you're going to sacrifice for them. Let me just give you a little illustration with this. My daughter loves Barbies, fairies, and tea parties. Okay? She does. My daughter is Eva. She's two and a half years old, almost three. Okay? She, she loves Barbies, fairies, tea parties. In fact, just even this morning, okay, she spent the night at my mom's house, and my mom brought her in to, to, to service because Rachel and I had a whole lot to do to try to set everything up today. We knew that was coming. And so my mom had her for, for, for last night extra. And so Ziva came in, and the first thing she wanted to do was to show me this toy, put a tea dress on, drag me off to the side, and say, we got to have a tea party. Because she loves tea parties. I, I, I don't know if she's British deep down inside somewhere. I, I, I don't know if we, maybe we have British in my genes. I don't know. But, but she loves tea parties. She loves the little dainty little cups and the dainty little, I'm like, man, give me a, give me a two liter. You know, that's what I want to drink. I don't want to, you know, and pinky, you know, and it, it, but she loves tea parties and she loves Barbies and she loves fairies. And so her, for her, if you're having like a Barbie fairy tea party, she's in her gold primes. Like, ah, ha, ha, Barbie fairy tea parties, you know, and she just gets all excited. Now, here's the thing. I love my daughter, which means that I need to learn to love Barbie fairy tea parties, not tolerate. I need to love it because she loves it. Okay, so I, I've learned to. I love it. I'm a, I'm a man, okay? And I'm very comfortable with my masculinity. And I'm perfectly fine with that. And I love Barbie fairy tea parties. Let's bring Tinkerbell and Periwinkle and Melorosa. And let's bring all the fairies. Let's, yeah, I know the names. And you bring the little cubs. And you go and you sit down. And I, I, I instigate the game sometimes. Because I love playing the games with her. And so I'll go up to Ziva and I'll be like, hey, Ziva. She goes, yes, daddy. I'm like, would you like to play Barbies? She goes, ah. And she loves it that I instigate playing Barbies. Okay? And it's not that I sit down and I'm all, the, I'm, not a, I'm not a girly man. Okay? I'm not. I, 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 love, I love blowing things up. You know, when my brother-in-law and I get together with fireworks, I'm in my prime. I love it, man. I want to see things. I want fire. I want boom. You know, one of the things I love waking my daughter up with is lighting sparklers in the house and going into her room and going, Ziva. She goes, ah, fireworks. I'm like, yeah, baby. You know, <laughs> I, I love fire. <laughs> Could you not? Okay. But I love my daughter and I learned to love Barbies and tea parties because she loves this. I go, Ziva. Let's play Barbie. She goes, yeah. And then we go and we play. I'm not tolerating it. I'm loving it because I love her. 
okay, because I love her. There are various shows on TV that I really, really, really love watching. There are some shows that, that I never would watch if it weren't for my wife being in my life. Okay, and I love her. And so I have learned to love certain shows, not tolerate, but really love the shows. And so my wife's like, oh, it's Bones, it's Bones, and they're getting married. They're getting married. Okay, five years ago, I would be like, who cares? She's an arrogant little wench. I have no business worrying about what she, I don't care. You know, and, and, and I, just wouldn't, I would not watch Bones. My wife loves Bones, so she watches Bones. And so I'm like, okay, my wife loves Bones. So she's like, it's the wedding. It's the wedding. They're getting married. Or a couple of weeks after that, she's like, oh, oh, it's, we got to watch Bones. We got to watch, it's the honeymoon. So I asked her, what show do you want to watch? She goes, oh, we got to watch Bones. It's their honeymoon. We got to see what happens. And we get to the living room, and I already have it teed up. It's already on pause, ready to watch. Why? Because I know she loves it. And I'm like, yes, it's the honeymoon. And I'm just as excited as she is. I'm not doing this. You know, I let her do that for me. And, 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 and <laughs> But I'm excited because I love her. And I love what she loves. Okay, If you're going to say you love Jesus, he loves the church. Jesus loves the church. And if you're going to say that you love Jesus, but you can't stand the church, you are a liar about your love for Jesus. If you say you love Jesus, but you do not strengthen, support, or sacrifice for, or, or anything of those, you don't do that for the church, you are a liar. If my daughter were to say, Daddy, let's play Barbies. And I go, Daddy doesn't like Barbies. You have to play by yourself. You hear that? Is that loving to my daughter? No. But we say that to the church. No, I'm not going to support you. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to sacrifice. I'm not going to serve. I'm just going to sit there. I'm going to sit at home. I'm going to go to Chuck E. Cheese. I'm going to do whatever I want. The church can go just do whatever it wants with itself. I'm going to do my own thing. And then you say you love God? Liar. Liar. You might as well go to a little girl and tell her that you don't like her toys and she can go play with herself. Because you're lying. You don't love Jesus. You can't. They're together. If you love Jesus, you will love his bride. And it is, a, it is the heart of the issue. That is what is happening in our world, that the people of the church do not love the church. And the people of, this, of the church do not love Jesus. And here's the problem now. you got people fighting over eternal punishment because they don't get the holiness of God. They haven't wrapped their mind around that at all. And then they don't love the church. And why would we ever expect the world to give two hoots about what the church does if the people in the church don't understand God and they don't love the church? See why these are the two key elements? And messing these up has messed up the church's influence and impact for the kingdom of God in our society. We have completely dropped the ball. So many people say, well, I love God and I love the church. Well, great. Are you helping her grow? Are you going out and bringing more people into the church? Are you going out and sharing the kingdom of God? Well, no, I'm not doing that. Then you're not sharing Jesus. You don't love them then. It'd be like me never talking about my kids and never talking about my wife. Might as well take my wedding ring off and put it in my pocket and go talk to girls. That's what it's saying. If you want to live your life and not talk about Jesus, you're basically taking off your metaphorical wedding ring, popping it in your pocket, and you're not talking about whom you love. And the love's not there. And liar, complete liar. That becomes our checklist. Do you love Jesus? Do you love his bride? Is his bride perfect? No. And if you're part of it, it's going to be less per imperfect, more imperfect. <laughs> right? Do you love his bride? Let's have a word of prayer.